All right, hello, hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. <laughs> good, good. Well, all right, welcome to day two of the Global Hospitality Summit presented by the International Hospitality Institute. My name is Tejal Patel. I am President and CEO of Neem Tree Hospitality, and I am the Female Director for the Western Division of AHOA. I will be your moderator today. Um, for this session's topic, which is on hospitality resiliency in the age of COVID-19, lessons learned and opportunities. My distinguished panelists and I will be having an open conversation on some of the lessons the industry has learned or should learn from COVID-19, as well as some of the areas of opportunities that we all foresaw. But first, I would love for my two panelists to please introduce themselves. Uh, let's just go ahead and start with Steve first. Oh, this feels very political that a Brit has gone before an American, so uh, I apologise. <clears throat> I don't want any international problems. Um, but uh, no, my name is Steve Lowy. Uh, my background is hospitality. I studied it. I've worked in it my whole career. I've run Backpackers Hostels, uh, set up my own hotel chain. And today I'm CEO of Anglo Educational Services and the Residence Apartments. Anglo is a study, study abroad provider and housing uh, a provider for students, mainly from the States. We work with 150 different universities from the States. We're students in, in the UK, uh, mainly in London. And we also have um, uh, a luxury service apartment brand aimed at the corporate uh, sector, uh, where we have 75 apartments across five locations, all in central London. Excellent. Well, welcome. We're so happy to have you. You know, I'll go ahead and try and you know, start off the conversation and with you, of course, Steve. So um, it's my personal belief that when things are going good, uh, we tend to forget about the bad times and the feelings we once experienced when we were going through that difficult time. So um, I want to ask you within your respective role, um, where, where were you in your professional life um, when you realized that the pandemic was about to um, basically create upheaval and you had to strategically uh, pivot um, how did you do that? Well, pivot, I always find, sounds very painful. And I think for the hospitality sector, it was um, in reality. I was actually on campus at UC Berkeley in an auditorium with 149 uh, young people who it was their life dream to come and study and, and work in London in the summer of 2022. So I was there March the the week of March the 9th uh, obviously Trump did his speech on the 11th I believe and I returned back to London on Friday the 13th uh, when you land on Friday the 13th you should know uh, you're in for a difficult time and <clears throat> to be honest I hadn't slept um, whilst I was um, whilst I was in the States because as I was there things were starting to cancel things were starting to unravel and it was, it was I've never experienced anxiety I thought I had COVID because it's pain across my chest of like ah, what are we going to do and so I landed on the Friday I sat with all the heads of the department in the office I went straight from the airport via via a shower room and I said to them quite frankly I have no idea how we're going to get out of this at this moment in time I, ha I just do not know before I left I said we've got two options one this will blow over or two the world will stop turning and our whole market was international and um, we're a very little island you know uh, that was going to leave Europe it was, it was a very, very difficult time. So what was interesting when I returned is that people were still in the pubs here. There was no social distancing. There was no masks. And obviously when I was in San Francisco, things had shut down. There was that famous uh, cruise ship that had been uh, docked at Oakland Harbor that we went past on the way to the airport. And so I could sort of see what was coming uh, slightly before people who were in the UK, uh, even though we had all these situations in Italy. Um, but yeah, that, that was the point. And then by Monday or Tuesday, we'd sat down and we'd completely redone our business model. We have residential apartments, so we were allowed to operate, but we can operate on an international market basis. We had to really try and pivot and, tr and change the way that we were going to do things. Um, and it was, it was very tough. Yeah, no, I completely understand. And, you know, I, after myself, after I had finally, um, just got tired of working for other people and, um, you know, kind of just stopped doing like freelance advising as I called it. I decided to finally create my company, Neem Tree Hospitality. And, um, you know, I was so excited. I had no idea um, how to build uh, or how to create an LLC or whatever. So I did my filing. Uh, I'm all excited. 
I'm going to grad school, I'm getting my MBA. And then all of a sudden the pandemic hits and I was just like, crap, like what am I supposed to do now? Um, after I just signed my first franchise agreement. And so um, during that time, our family, we were also um, opening up a brand new Marriott property. And so then I came on as opening manager. So immediately kind of became, okay, so this part is stagnant. What will be my next move? So, and I'm sure plenty of people just felt that um, worldwide. So um, I'll go ahead and start with our next question. Um, we, when we had our prep call, we talked a little bit about uh, soft branding and soft branding has just become all the rage in North America. Um, but you mentioned something about how it's a little bit different in Europe. Um, why isn't soft branding really um, picking up speed from the pandemic as in other areas? Well, I think it's probably we've always been reversed when it comes to franchising and brands between Europe and, and the States. You have way more franchise properties, way more big branded properties. We have a larger percentage of independent hotels. I think the definition of soft brand is quite important. And a soft brand within a Marriott chain, as opposed to a Best Western style soft brand, is very different. I think it's the ability to deliver revenue, because ultimately at the moment for most hotels, depending on where you're located, cash is king. And so if a brand is not delivering, you know, if, if you're joining a soft brand, um, then there has to be value because otherwise you do it yourself. And I think that's with all brands, soft and, and harder brands and franchises, is I think the brands have to really deliver now because ultimately we're all in it together when it was crap, as you said, <laughs> but we all need to get out of the crap together. And the brands and the owners and the operators, depending on how that structure is, is really, really important. So I think when we talked about it, I was talking about soft brands that, that really deliver value for those owners, that really help drive revenue, that get costs down, that part of a buying group. We're, we're completely independent. And our, our corporate apartments have run at 94% occupancy. We have no buying group. We have our own sales and revenue team. We, we're small, we're nimble, and we were able to pivot really quickly without asking permission from a brand owner. And obviously some hotels just went ahead and did stuff anyway, and they quite like that freedom. So I think the whole um, brand, owner, operator relationship has been changed fundamentally, as it has been with OTAs, because I think some of the OTAs have not dealt with this whole situation very well, left a lot of hotels in the lurch, even left some customers in the lurch. And because it was such a difficult moment for everybody, I think everyone will remember it. And I'm sure, Tejal, you've got experiences of either brand or OTA or whatever. And you're like, well, hang on a second. You know, we're supposed to do this together in a partnership. And I think that's where it is. And I think if you're opening a hotel, Brooklyn is part of a hotel management company where I'm, I'm staying and I'm uh, speaking tomorrow. They have over 200 hotels in the UK. Some are branded. Majority of that they've created their own brand. Brooklyn is their own brand. They also have Hotel Gotham in Manchester. You know, management companies will create their own brands and they may be seen as soft brands, but they're actually their own brand, their own managed brand within their consortia. And they may balance the risk against larger, well, more well-known brands. You know, I love how you brought up about the partnership between the brands and the owners and the management, because my personal belief is that the pandemic really did test these relationships. I think that we saw we really saw who pulled through um, in our worst times. And it was a bad time for, for everyone. Um, for, for us, we had some issues with you know, our lenders. We really saw how some of those relationships really were worth uh, you know, in our time of need. And then we saw how some of the brands either stepped up to the plate or they didn't. Um, I think, but we also saw how there was a lot of love lost between um, employees and management. So how, do you think we can rebuild that trust as we go forward? Like, how do we attract new people to do business with and, and work in our establishments? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, I'm in little old Britain. Oh, Peter, we've Sorry, missed you. I, I, I have to, to do a lot of uh, uh, acrobatics and Jeffrey and uh, Jade were very kind. Uh, to help me. So at least you can hear me. I can speak. I, I'm here. My apologies to everyone, to the listeners. This is the first time I have no idea what happened. But anyway, we're not going to waste time. 
I've been listening to Steve and I've been listening to Tejo and, and, and I don't think that you guys were in great hands. So here I am and I will join now. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Well, you know, um, let's go ahead. So we just um, asked one of our questions. So, uh, Peter, I would love for you just to do a brief introduction about yourself. Um, and then if you like, and if Steve is okay, then if you can go ahead and answer the question that I had just asked. Sure. Uh, uh, my pleasure. Thank you so much again. My apologies for this, this hiccup. Uh, uh, you know, I, I describe myself as, as a student for life. I mean, that's what I do. I'm a ha having uh, a successful career in the hospitality industry over the past four decades. I still felt that we did not learn enough to deal with this pandemic, right? I mean, uh, all of us, uh, you know, that, that are here and also our, 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 our listeners, I'm sure we've gone through 9-11, we've gone through SARS, we've gone through Ebola, we've gone through the financial crisis. But nothing prepared us for this pandemic, right? So we kind of got caught uh, in a way that that uh, we had no plan, action plan ready. Uh, we, I think, what well, your first question was, if I recall now, is that where were we when this happened, right? I mean, wasn't that the the question? And and I remember I was simply preparing for a meeting uh, with my staff, my corporate staff, to go over. Uh, what we are going to accomplish in 2020 in terms of financial performance, in terms of buying, in terms of what our pipeline is going to look like, all of those things, and 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 had no clue that everything is going to be just radically just going to blow up, right? And and it did. Um, so so I think uh, uh, my my uh, sense here is that you know you know we. We, we need to, to, to figure out a way to prepare ourselves and our team and our stakeholders when things of this nature occur. I mean, you never know. We did not even know. I did not even know the word COVID existed in my vocabulary, right? Uh, we didn't know who Pfizer was or what Moderna was and what CDC was. I mean, we never, never, never really thought about these things. And all of a sudden, that has become part of our lives. I mean, just just last week, the the, the Secretary General of the United Nations uh, sent out a very powerful and and very telling and emotional uh, plea, saying, "Listen, today he said marks five million deaths in the world because of COVID," and and his 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 comment was, and it was very telling. He said, "This is not just a number on a piece of paper." These 5 million people, they're our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, our fathers, our wives, our husbands, our grandfathers. And for, for, for us to not take this pandemic seriously and, and try and help others and help ourselves, you know, you hear people fighting this, this masking policy. And, and I don't want to get this uh, into a political uh, discussion, right? But let's face it, we all have the responsibility to protect ourselves and our coworkers and our families and our stakeholders. And I think, uh, um, I, I just think that we, we, we have learned our lesson. I think we need to do a better job in preparing ourselves uh, because uh, I personally, as a CEO of a company, have learned quite a bit. Uh, you know, people that we took a lot of things for granted. Right. I mean, I'm sure Steve could uh, could comment on that as well. Uh, you know, employees, we 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 talked about how much we value our employees, but it was all like uh, it, it was a it, it was just a pep talk. Right. I mean, we we really need to feel that they really make a difference. They are the ones who really drove our successes and our performances. It wasn't I, you know, back then, pre pandemic, you, you heard, I'm sure. You know, CEOs were just barking orders from the top and employees were expected to do what they tell them. Now things have changed a bit. Now the CEOs are going, if the information is flowing upward, the, employees, the CEOs are going to the employees, asking them questions, how should we do things? What do you think about this? Can we do this? And I think that itself is, is a very, very refreshing idea. Um, and, and I think we ought to continue with that. So I'll, I'll let you, uh, uh, Steve, um, chime in, I'm sure. Yeah. So, no, I think, 
um, <clears throat> one of the things that we discussed was that pre-pandemic, there was so much fo focus on asset. And I think most hotel companies and owners felt the asset was a physical property, not people. And people are actually the most important thing because you could do a virtual hotel out in the countryside without physical property um, if you have the right people. And I think that was lost with the growth of wanting to put as many flags in the ground, getting bigger, you know, this whole explosion of, of tourism. What a lot of people forgot to do was not only uh, uh, having a people plan, not a piece of paper saying, I want to be nice to people, as, as Peter said, like generally actually having an in-depth people plan that was a core part of the vision and mission of that business. And that's, I believe, at HOD level, heads of department level, at GM level, at regional level, at owner level, at brand level. And it's, it's massively important. That's engaging with the young people, engaging with uh, academia, retention. If you retain the staff, you don't need to recruit. You know, it's, it's really having a plan for that. I also think, and it may be a, a lost in translation thing, but staff, for me, by saying staff, it sounds like people who work for slaves, you know, people who work in, uh, in a domineering fashion that have been told what to do and have got no say. And so changing things to team members, being part of a team, as we talked about even before, is really, really important. And I think creating true teams that are dynamic, that are integrated, that are multicultural, is the joy of working in hospitality. And I think that's where some of the independent owners and smaller operators have done really well because they're so much closer to those team members on the ground. And I think, as Peter said, CEOs coming and getting involved with that, they should have always got involved with that because people are, you know, they're the second, second biggest cost in, in terms of normally after property, but potentially the most important and I, I personally have always felt that every property I've run that people have always been the most important and again our advantage was we're smaller and more nimble it doesn't mean that we're not have, finding it difficult and I think for us the retention is not so bad but if we want to grow out of this that is where our challenge is going to be and the UK have had a double whammy of Covid but also Brexit and you know London lost 750,000 people pre the Christmas lockdown and so they believe it was a million people left by the time Brexit happened on the 1st of January. Wow. That's a lot in an 8 million population city. Now, 25% have come back, either from Europe or from living in the countryside. That's, that's still a lot. You know, that's over 10% of the workforce from finance directors to, to uh, chambermaids. And so we have a really difficult thing here in terms of encouraging all sorts of people uh, into into the hospitality sector, and uh, I, I I've heard it's global, but you know I think it, it's it's certainly a, a bigger challenge here. You know that's um what I'm hearing is is that basically in order to um, rebuild that trust, it's going to take more of a collaborative effort from all the stakeholders. Um, and when you said earlier, there's so many people who left the industry. About fifty percent of workers have left hospitality and more than half of them are not going to come back. So now it just takes, it's really incumbent upon all of us to really try and shift the culture within our organizations and see where we can find that new talent. Um, I want to shift a little bit into talking about some opportunities. I think one special opportunity that we saw during the pandemic was that there was this huge interest in extended stay and the economy segment. Um, and furthermore, if it was an economy extended stay, then it did phenomenal. So um, do you do, do either of you foresee a boom in overdevelopment in this segment? And as asset managers and developers, have we really learned our lesson? I'll start with Peter. You know, um, you, you hear about, about companies shifting their pipeline into from a core branded hotels to an extended stay model, or you see some of the hotels who are full service, they're changing into an apartment type of situation. Uh, and those things are all valid and, and it makes sense, right? I mean, and there are hotels that I know, for example, uh, a 200 room full service hotel with two different entrances on either end of the building is now trying to create a dual brand within the same hotel, uh, you know, same flag, because if it's an IAG or if it's a, if it's a Marriott or it's a Hyatt, 
uh, you don't want to deal with this brain damage of liquidated damages and things like that if you switch brands, right? Because uh, most hotel companies are not very, uh, they, they, they're not very uh, forgiving in terms of LDs, uh, liquidated damages now, because they, they're losing flags, right? A lot, of, a lot of hotels did not, a lot of hotel companies, when the time came for renewal of the franchise agreement, during this pandemic or, or shortly thereafter, decided not to renew it because they had no idea what was happening. Uh, so I think uh, uh, dual brand is clearly an opportunity if it can be done, but, but if it means that you don't have the elevators and this, I'm not an engineer, so it's, it's got to be something that we need to have someone look at it, right? To see if it's even possible. You don't want to force a model where it doesn't work. So, so, so I think extended stay only because people are taking longer vacations. That the new thing now is that the employers are encouraging their employees to take longer vacation, yet they are allowing them on the extended portion of their PTO or vacation to, to, to work remotely. So if you want to take your family to Hawaii for two weeks, you only have one week PTO, but you want to go for two weeks, they are allowing you to do that as long as the second week you're working remotely and you're being productive. And so a lot of those opportunities are being presented. Therefore, it becomes incumbent for developers to consider possibly a shift in terms of what product that they want to offer. But just quickly, I, I wanted to, you know, you talk about what else we can do. And I think, in my opinion, to stay competitive, right, in this environment, that, that this is an unprecedented time that we're living in. No question about it. I have never seen anything like this. My colleagues who are great, accomplished hoteliers, people I know and you know, uh, are saying the same thing. Nobody knew what to do, and therefore we're all learning and we're adapting and we're evolving. So the five things that I would say, uh, Tejal, to, 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 to stay competitive would be to keep evolving. And like Steve said, academia is part of it. Keep learning. Learn more tricks. Do things that, that you never considered in the past. Stay curious. Number two, always you know, figure out what else is everybody else doing? What else the global industry is doing? How are things in Paris? How are things in Dubai? How are they in Istanbul? How are they in Mumbai? What, what are other people doing? Learn from it. Don't shut yourself and think that we are the best of the best. Because part of our problem, honestly, in U.S., is that we think that we're the best. <laughs> it's always that we and 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 Steve is shaking head because he's from UK, right? How many times uh, have you heard? I we say, that. Oh, we have the biggest, we are the best, and we are the largest, and yeah. we're the. It, it, it's a mindset. We cannot. We are not. Nothing matters anymore at this point. What matters is you keep evolving. Number one, stay curious. Three, embrace technology. I think there's a question about technology on here that we probably saw. Uh, uh, of course, but at the same time, don't misuse technology when you can make a phone call instead of a Zoom call. Don't waste everybody's time to get them on a Zoom call and try and prepare because you could easily make a phone call and talk about things that you want to talk about. So, so just an example, uh, focus on the big picture. Focus on the big picture, number four, uh, because, you know, and, and, and the, the best way to, to, to really think if we are, we as leaders are focusing on a big picture. Think about the last 48 hours, the decision that you and I have made. Could that decision have been made by someone about two or three notches below you and therefore save you time to think about a bigger picture for the company? And finally, and most importantly, start working on relationships. Relationships with the internal stakeholders, the external stakeholders, all are very important. It is the, um, the high degree of adaptability requires you to create new relationship yet maintain the old relationship and learn from, from all this that we, we have dealt with over the past uh, 24 months. Sorry. <laughs> no, absolutely. You're totally fine. And I'm loving these questions that we're having come in from the audience. So thank you all so much. Um, and I'll try to integrate them as we go into the last uh, 15 minutes of our program. Um, but I'll actually start with Russ. So, um, you know, as one thing that we saw, right, is finally we saw a little bit of more 
easing into adopting technologies into our properties. Um, the owner or developer who was once a little bit scared to do so is now all in. So um, Russ asks, um, what are some of the integrated uh, mobile apps or access controls and lighting controls or, you know, just all sorts of automation or tech that you all have implemented in your properties to shift the guest experience. Uh, Steve? Yeah, I mean, obviously we operate in the extended stay model, both from a student perspective and also from a luxury perspective. Um, the luxury side's run at 90% occupancy plus since, since uh, March, really good ADR. And we're just going back to Peter's of the previous question, the, the adaptability and the flexibility of, of apartments is far greater than the hotel room. Yeah, you can feel, you can live, you can stay there for two or three nights, but what we like is to say that people live with us. And when people live with you, the amount of technology is more about a living experience than a functional experience of a short-term stay. And that's a hotel room or an apartment. And so one of the things I think is the issue with the industry <clears throat> generally is everyone follows everyone because, oh, well, they've got that. I must have it rather than actually this really fits in my brand or my style of the hotel. You know, uh, here they've got a bit of technology. The Wi-Fi is really quick. It's a normal shower. It's a normal light switch and it's an air conditioning. You know, there's no apps. It's a pretty new build. If I'd have had an app on my phone and I've got an old iPhone, uh, COVID times, you know, um, and I couldn't download the app and then it, I couldn't get to the key. You know, I've done it before. I've stayed in a very large branded hotel beginning with an H that I, I had to download the app, get the key, got to the key, which was like miles away. You got to the room and didn't work. So I had to go all the way back. I'd been on a 14 hour flight. That was technology that made my life a pain. A key card would have sufficed. And I think that's where the challenge is, is there are trends that have happened of COVID that will not last forever. And there's some that will be around for a long time. And I think cleanliness is really important and how you can clean a room using technology. I think ease of use, just make things easy. You know, Wi-Fi, you don't need to give your size, the size of your feet to get Wi-Fi logins, yeah? Just simple, good quality Wi-Fi, great showers, you know, bathrooms that look like they've been looked after. Beds that are comfortable and clean, that there's no stains on the on the sheets, you know, all of that sort of stuff, which is actually not technology, it's actually basic hospitality, I think have come through as even more important now than before. I agree if you've got the right brand and the right property, if you can add in cool bits of tech to enhance the experience, then great. But again, I stayed in a large budget hotel chain here um, on Friday at an airport, and they had all these check-on kiosks. There was eight check-in kiosks. My one didn't work. So I said, to someone. Yep. And then I saw the next person check in. Same thing happened. So it defeated the purpose. It just added, it actually ruined the guest experience because I might as well just checked in straight away. And so that's where I think it's really important to choose the right technology that's in your budget for your property. Doesn't matter what the competitors are doing. It's really about yourself. You can learn from them, but just see if it really fits in. That's my personal opinion from an old fashioned Brit. Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree. I mean, you know, I think I've seen some concepts where there's all these different types of technologies in a place, but really, is it worth it? Do you really need this? Can, does your, whoever your client is staying in your hotel, are they going to be able to understand it? Will your team members be able to, you know, uh, troubleshoot if there's any issues? So that's what's really important is, you know, don't just like throw a bunch of things at the wall and see what sticks, you know, um, you have to be very strategic in this. Um, I want to, we have Michaela who is asking about um, sustainability. So she asked, how has sustainability played into the build back better for hotel companies as a result of the pandemic? And um, what are the lessons we've learned for the environment as a result? Um, Peter? You know, um, we, we've, we, we're all talking about the same thing. You know, there's well, sometime when you are listening to people or you're looking at the questions, it appears that there is and an overabundance of, 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 of emphasis on technology. Then on the other side, if you uh, look at some of the other people speaking like yesterday and today, they're saying, let's not focus on technology as much, let's focus on the human element, right? As, the, as, as Steve mentioned earlier, it's the people business. 
And I think that the 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 to, the sustainability is has got many many factors. You know, you've got economic sustainability, psychological and physical and emotional and and all of those things. And and it's a it's a subject that requires like many hours of conversation. You know, we use this word sustainability so lightly, same way we use uh, you know uh, diversity and inclusion, right? And I think we talked about it before. A lot of a lot of time we we say these things uh, and and companies come out uh, and and announce in a big way saying oh well we just hired a vice president of diversity for our company. I mean okay well, what does that mean <laughs> really I mean it's it's not about hiring a director of diversity for an airline or a hotel company or or even major brand. The idea is how do you execute that mindset that you have about being diverse and being just and being equal and being fair to your employees? That is what we need to do. We need to make sure that that we don't simply use diversity and inclusion and and race and and all of the other elements that go into it uh, as a window dressing, right? We need to be real. We need to show that that our for example if i say that i believe in diversity for my company then my my payroll register for my company that has all the employees listed somebody should be able to look at those 100 people 150 people and say oh he's got people from this part of the world that part of the world you know they speak this language or they're culturally different somebody should be able to see that and say ha ah, you truly have a diverse workforce so in my opinion, you know, uh, as I said last time, I think we spoke, the, the globalization and the new technologies have sharply reduced the efficacy of command and control management. And uh, it's accompanying forms of corporate communication. We were talking about it earlier. You know, things have reversed now, and we are now going back. We are talking to these line employees. One of the things that I think we ought to do, and I think I, uh, Chazel, you and I spoke about it before, you know how when we create our budgets every year, right? And I'm sure most of us have already created our 2022 operating budget. If not, uh, if you're like me, you know, sometime you're late. Some, but uh, but most of them are most of us are done, right? Because you you normally you go to the property, you sit down with the staff, you listen to them, you ask them for their opinion, and you know how what do you think we ought to be doing? Any new program, new initiative? Uh, but one of the things that that we ought to do and seriously consider doing is that. Hotels and CEOs of the hotel companies and lenders and capital partners require you to put three or four percent FF&E reserve, right? I mean, we do that just in case if something blows up, uh, you know, if we have to change a, a boiler or if there's a, a tornado or something, there's always that reserve. Why can't we come up with one percent or two percent for the employee emergencies every year? Think about it. A 1% in, in a fund somewhere where if there is, God forbid, another emergency or, or anything like this happens, a catastrophe, right? You can go into that fund and help people, employees who need diapers, who need food for their babies or their parents who are sick. Because by the time the government comes around, it may be a few weeks uh, or months before that kicks in the program, we as Responsible leaders must have a plan to take care of our employees. End of story. We have to do it. If we don't do it, then then this all this uh, uh, you know programs about the shield and and sanitizers and spending money, all those machines that that you know like Terminator, you walk into your room and start. <laughs> you know, hitting the room like some of our hotels do. You buy this piece of equipment to sanitize your room before the, the housekeeper comes out. We need to, to, you know, it's not about the glamour anymore. It's not about luxury. Luxury right now has changed into safety. So a guest at, you know, Four Seasons or, or uh, Ritz Carlton or W uh, has the same need today as a person who's staying at the Holiday Inn Express and say, First of all, Mr. Owner, Mr. Manager, tell me, am I safe in your hotel? If you can prove that I'm safe in the environment that I'm coming into, then the rest is secondary. But safety, as Steve said too, I guess, is very important. Yeah, that's why it goes back to the people plan. If you don't have a people plan and it's not, 
it's not just a one moment in time. It should have been happening before and it's got to happen in the future. But with sustainability, I think we talked about it last time, you know, towels on the floor or not on the floor, you know, hung up. People are very cynical about that now. And I think if you are going to be sustainable, actually do it. And I, I, I fear that we're just in another cycle of people talking about it. Um, we can only do certain amounts. Most of our new buildings are because you have to build in a, in a s- sustainable way. The older buildings that we actually managed to, to, to hand back, back to landlords through COVID were terribly inefficient. And we can see that by our bills now. But I think, you know, we plant trees and we do a lot of stuff, but I think sustainability is, is a sustainable business in many, well, uh, m- many ways. It's working with the local community. It's looking after your people. It's looking after the environment. Uh, and sustainability is a broad, broad subject. Hence why this conference over here in the UK has gone on for two and a half weeks. Uh, architect I work with is actually up there talking about sustainable building. It's a really different way of looking at how you build, particularly in 100 or 100 or 200 year old buildings that are not allowed to be really touched in central London. You know, and that that will be a big thing, I think, with um, with hotels going forward, is how you renovate in a sustainable way without being a cost prohibitive. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Excellent points, gentlemen. I mean, I think that as we move forward, I mean, now that we have a generation of travelers coming in and they are demanding to see how your establishment is, is sustainable and in what in different ways, you know, how are you treating your people right? Are you, again, safety? Am I going to be safe at your property? So um, all of these are very valid things that we all need to think about as we move forward. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about something that didn't, things that did not work. Uh, we saw a lot of trends that happened, like staycation packages and work from hotels and, um, you know, doing uh, rooms for uh, special um, uh, emergency programs. What do you gentlemen see not really going to carry with us in the future? I think that work from a hotel room thing, <laughs> it works well for apartments, actually. It works really well because you can you can live there, you can work there, you can cook as if you were at home. But I think what you will see is potentially, depending on the brand, is a dynamic change in the lobby area to make it easy for people to work in an environment, a co-working style, not a formal co-working space, but a flexible space. Goes back to the the, the product design. The more flexibility you have in, that that's what didn't work because I think. They were they were putting desks into hotel rooms that were not ideal for 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 that purpose. But actually, if you you build new and, and or you renovate new and you look at how you can flex things up and keep the design and keep the efficiency of that space, I think that's what we've learned. That just shoving something in the corner doesn't necessarily change it. I do think staycations will stay, um, and I think people will probably do where they may have just travelled abroad the whole time. They will at least do one staycation a year even if it's a long weekend, that really helps coastal and rural hotels. I agree. Peter? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think Steve is 100% uh, correct uh, that, that the less of a, we need to have touchless options, right? Uh, from the time you enter, you know, the Hilton's have them, Hyatt's have them, Marriott's have them, everybody has them, you know. Has, a, has an app right now. Now you can't even, don't even have to touch the doorknob when you go into your guest room. You, you know, it's, it's, it's that retina connection and then just door open. So, so all those things will continue and that falls into the design aspect that, that Steve was talking about. You know, more and more design companies, you know, one of the top uh, hotel design groups and architects uh, uh, have come up with different models because of the situation that we're in. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I, I have one thought. And for those of you that had the op- opportunity to listen to, to my friend and, 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 and he's my mentor, uh, Horst Schulte, yesterday, uh, I still speak to him. Uh, uh, and he had said uh, one time, he said, deep down, we are host to people who want to feel well. We are creating well-being. How simple can it be? How mo- it probably is the simplest thing that we're trying to do is we want to create well-being for our guests who enter through our front doors. How we do it is up to us. We are the leaders. We have the ability. We know the designers. We know the brand. We work in conjunction and 
and, and, and collaborate with all of these people to come. We alone cannot do it. You're going to need your ownership group. You're going to need the brand. You need the lender. You need the employees. You need everyone to sit in the room and say, how can we do it? And I think uh, when you establish that sort of a relationship with all stakeholders, internal and external, uh, giving somebody a, a 50% discount is not going to bring people to your hotel room. Trust me, that doesn't work. We talked about this new segment of uh, VFR, which is visiting friends and relatives, right? A huge thing over the last two, 12 months where people drove three, four, five hours and extended their stay. They, they can't stay at their relative's home, so they stayed at the hotel, and that was an understanding, and nobody you know, mind doing that because we were in a COVID environment. Uh, so, so a lot of those things are happening. And then with the opening of this 30, you know, U.S. just allowed 33 countries open the borders yesterday or day before, people are going nuts right now. Everybody's traveling all over. Let's hope, let's hope that we are all responsible and doing the right things while we're having fun and traveling across the globe. Uh, and and I, I hope that that trend will continue as long as we all can protect each other and, and be safe. So. Well, excellent, excellent. We are just about out of time. So in 30 seconds, um, what is the main message that you would like for our audience to take away? I'll start with Steve. To build back better, put your people first. That's it, simple. All right, Peter? <laughs> simple, yeah, simple. I think we agree. I mean, you know, across the pond, we still think the same. Um, uh, people first, take care of your employees, before, because if you take your employees, they will take care of your guests, then the guests will keep coming back, and then you don't need to worry about anything. Simple as that. That's Beautiful advice. Thing. So thank you very much for, for listening. Again, my apology for the, for the earlier technical difficulty. That's why I don't want to rely too much on technology. See, this is what happens. Well, that's why hopefully we will actually have this uh, happen live uh, next year in person. So, um, Really happy uh, for today's program. Please stay tuned. We have the next session coming up. And um, yes, everyone take care and be safe and um, move forward. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much.